welcome to this episode of ASH Podcast. I'm Fred Wyant with the American Sexual Health Association, ASHA. And today, we're going to be talking about the most common sexually transmitted infection you've probably never even heard about, trichomoniasis, or trick, as we like to call it. It's a very common, curable STI caused by, it's a parasite, it's caused by a parasitic protozoa called trichomonas vaginalis. And when I see it's common, the CDC estimates there are roughly two million cases in the U.S. each year. Most people with trick don't even have obvious symptoms, so it's a bit under the radar given how common it is. Um, and even though it is curable, the right antibiotics, it's not a trivial thing. Having trick can make it easier to contract or transmit other STDs like HIV. And as someone who's pregnant, having trick is associated with things like uh, preterm delivery and having low birth weight babies, babies less than five and a half pounds. So there's a lot to talk about here. And in, of course, in order to cure it and manage it, you have to diagnose it. So we're gonna spend some time today talking all about trick diagnostics with none other than Dr. Barbara Vanderpoel, a professor in the Schools of Medicine and Public Health at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Where, where she's also a scientist with the UAB Center for Women's Reproductive Health. Uh, beyond her positions there, she's the president of the International Society for STD Research. She's also an ASHA BFF and one of our advisors. So Dr. Vanderpoel, thank you and welcome. Oh, thanks, Fred, and call me Bobby. Bobby it is, all right. So let's dive right in. So in our discussion of diagnostic, let's start with who we should be testing, who should be screened for trick. You know, it's a, a really great and interesting question, and I think it's one of the reasons that we don't have better recommendations. Trichomonas is sort of unlike chlamydia and gonorrhea in that, in fact, older women are more likely to have cases of trichomonas. It peaks in women about between 45 and 55. So not where we normally think about STDs when we're managing patients, right? We think more about other causes of vaginitis. But that's where trick peaks, but that doesn't mean that it's not common. So even among adolescents, it can be more common than chlamydia in young women. Now, women are um, positive for trick about four times as often as men are. And that's just because of the biology of it. Trichomonas is a parasite, like you mentioned, which means it does not go inside cells. It just kind of hangs around in the environment. And you can picture that if it's in the urethra of a penis during urination, it can get washed out. So men don't tend to keep it as long, but they do have it and it is a sexually transmitted infection. And so it's important to understand that. So at our health department in Birmingham, we screen all women that are eligible for chlamydia screening for gonorrhea and trichomonas. And our prevalence at the STD clinic is about 22%. So wow. It's out there, you're right, it's common. It's a very common bud. And because there's so much of it in the population, that's not true in every population, but it is in ours. And because it's out there, we started screening all men with um, urethritis for a trick as well, because we're just thinking that if we only test for chlamydia and gonorrhea and we treat for that presumptively, and they come back, they're not responding to treatment and the chlamydia and gonorrhea are negative. Now we have to start over by testing for tricks. So it's actually much better for the patient just to go ahead and test upfront. And so then if you only treated for chlamydia and gonorrhea, at least when they're not responding, you would have that trichomonas result and you would know how to treat correctly. So, so screening for all three of them at one time, even in men works really well. So in my preamble, I talked about it's trick is common, but there aren't always obvious symptoms. And you mentioned the prevalence that you're dealing with in your setting. So let, let's talk about this, the whole angle of symptoms and maybe more to the point why symptoms are not sufficient for diagnosis, why you really need to do a, a good test. Well, so a couple of things. Um, about half of women don't have symptoms. So you were right. And actually it's a, only 46% of women in a large study that we did actually showed signs of having an infection. So we can't depend on, on having symptoms as our first cue. But for those women that do have symptoms, trichomonas is really common as a co-infection with other things like chlamydia or like gonorrhea. So a lot of times it's really difficult when you look at a woman and you go, okay, you have discharge, but what's causing that discharge? That's really unclear. And 
in many settings where they evaluate women for causes of vaginitis, which people somehow disassociate STIs and vaginitis, which is unfortunate because we should think in terms of comprehensive vaginal health for women. But anyway, when they think about vaginitis, they can test for TRIC and bacterial vaginosis and candida or yeast infections. But when they do that, it's really hard because the only way that you can tell the difference between a trichomonas, which moves when it's happy, uh, and a white blood cell, which obviously is inert, um, when they get cold, they're exactly the same size and room temperature is cold for them. So when the tricks stop moving, they look like white blood cells. And when we're talking about looking at things in a woman with discharge, she obviously has white blood cells. So the trick's hard to see. And so having good diagnostics is, I mean, they're easy to see if they're up and moving and running around, but that's just not always the case. And especially if you think about a woman who has co-infection with BV and trichomonas, well, there's so much going on on that microscope slide it gets really, really hard to tease out what's going on. So good diagnostics that can accurately tell you not only what's there, but everything that's there because there might be co-infections is really important. So you mentioned discharge as one potential symptom. I probably should have explored first what the symptoms, when symptoms do occur beyond a discharge, what kind of things would, would someone typically experience? It's, it's awfully similar to, as I said, chlamydia, gonorrhea, or even BV. You'll, you can have discharge. You can have um, burning on urination. You, know, you can have itching. You might have a strange smell, but that's not as likely as with some of the other um, pathogens. If your provider actually does a full-blown pelvic exam with a speculum, you might see what we call a strawberry cervix because trichomonas causes the cervix to bleed, but just in little punctate spots. And so you'll see little spots of red on the cervix, but you only see that in about 20% of cases as well, even when you're looking for it. So, so a lot of these things can be misleading and it's not really clear cut. So that's why laboratory-based diagnostics are really the way to go. Yeah, and that, I mean, you, you're really making the case for it there uh, quite, quite clearly. Um, are the clinicians uh, really up to speed on TRIC and who needs to be tested and how to go about testing? Or is there a lot of education there that needs to be done on that side? We do need a lot of education on that side. And it's a number of things. And that is, there's a little bit of circular logic in the dogma with TRIC. And that is that all women who have TRIC have symptoms. Therefore, we only test women with symptoms. Therefore, we only ever find TRIC in women with symptoms. So you can see how that feeds back on itself. Right. So that's the first thing. The other thing is TRIC are so fun to watch on a microscope. And if you've ever seen one, it's so super offensive if I tell you, you can miss them because you're like, what? They're big and huge. Do you think I'm blind? And it's like, no, that's not the issue at all. It's just all these other things that are going on. So I think that, I think that it's a matter of we've always done it this way and it's good enough. But the fact that we have so many untreated infections out there really clearly indicates it's not good enough. And we need to, we have new tools now. Why not use them, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm going to ask you about some of those new, new tools. There's a, there's a lot to really look at here. But first, I want to go back to, it sounds like what you were describing there in terms of the motility of the organism being able to see them. That sounds like the approach to testing. I think I'm the most familiar with the wet mouth. Is that what that, you're referencing there? That is right. Mm -hmm. So a sample of vaginal fluid is placed on the slide. You look at it under the microscope. Uh, is, is this the most common approach now? It is. It is. And I mean, the, the upside to it, like everything else that's done in a clinical care setting, the upside is that if you see it, then you're right, it's there. And so then you can treat the patient immediately. The problem is that if you don't see it, that doesn't mean it's not there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you may have touched on this, but I, I want to ask you about the reliability, the, the sensitivity of the wet mount. Uh, you were talking about it, it's just, you may, you may miss them. It's about 40%, really. Um, we've compared, when originally we compared it to culture a long time ago, but culture can take a week or more and it's just, it's not very, it's not very sensitive itself and it's time consuming and not every lab does it. So you know, then you weigh that against having an immediate result with the wet mount, and it's not much better. So people never really adopted culture. But now that we have the molecular tools, you know, if you can pick up four times as many cases, and this is what we've found happens. Um, and I'll just give you a slight example. And I know this isn't really what you're asking, but we had a program where we were working in a woman's detention center and every woman that came in was tested for chlamydia and gonorrhea. 
And about half of the women that would come in were tested for gonorrhea or for trichomonas as well. And at one point I reached out and I said, why do you only test some women for a trick? And they said, oh, well, we can tell who has it. We're pretty good at it, you know, because our, our prevalence is 50% or our positivity rate is 50%. So we have to be really good at it. We're picking the right women. And I said, well, you know, for three months, I'll just do it for free. And you just test every woman that you test for chlamydia gonorrhea. Let me do trick. And we increased case finding by 40% because they weren't picking all the right women. And so this is the thing we can't tell just because a woman has discharge, we're not that good at saying discharge means this if it's yellow or that if it's white or this if it's thin or that if it's chunky because people's bodies all react differently. And so again, that's where we go back to really needing something that's highly sensitive. You mentioned culture tests. Would you tell me, just explain, how do they work in trick? Well, so it's kind of nice. The new system actually comes in a pouch. There's a liquid medium in that pouch and you put the swab right in there and then pull the swab back out and roll the pouch shut. And then the bugs grow right inside that little pouch in an incubator. And you put the whole pouch right on the microscope. And so if there's anything in there, you can see it. It's actually a little difficult for those of us who are used to reading slides, because it's a lot of 3D, right? It's got thickness to it. So your plane of focus has to vary so that you can see them. But over three to five days, they'll reproduce. And so you'll get bigger and bigger and bigger numbers in there. And so obviously by the fifth day, if there's any in there, there should be enough in there that you can see them easily. Is a culture the best way to test somebody who makes their way through your door who possesses a penis? Or how would you go about that? No, I would still go with a molecular test. I would be looking for DNA of the bugs instead of culture because with a penis, remember that urethral surface that we can access with a swab is pretty small and we don't like to do that and guys don't like to have it done, but, and I use guys sort of loosely here, but the thing to remember about urine that comes through a penis, it's going to dilute that whole sample, right? And so if you didn't have many trichomonads in there to begin with, because maybe they got um, flushed out with the previous urination or what have you, you may have so few organisms and then you might have however much urine you get with that sample that dilutes it. So to try and culture that's really difficult. But molecular tests that are so sensitive and can pick up small numbers of DNA are really sensitive. And so that's the way to go with that. So you're leading lovely. That's a great segue to my next question. So I know the technology, as you referenced, is evolving around STI diagnostics and molecular tests are really, they're the kind of the next phase and maybe they're the current phase, however you would phrase that. Um, so how, how do nucleic acid amplification tests, NATS, how do they work for TRIC and are they really getting traction? Um, they are, and I think that the, I would say probably more than three quarters of the testing done in the US that's not wet mount, people are going to NATS and maybe as much as 90% even. I think people are really, we just kind of skipped the culture phase altogether because it was never that advantageous. So either people are doing a wet mount in clinic and basing their results on that or they're sending samples off for NATS. So it's taking traction in places that do chlamydia gonorrhea screening using NATS, which are the recommended test methodology for chlamydia and gonorrhea. So it's that same swab. You don't have to collect an extra one like you would for wet mount, right? You just collect the one swab, send it away for chlamydia gonorrhea trick, and Bob's your uncle, you get your results, so. And uh, the amplification piece of NATS has always fascinated me. So you're literally somehow amplifying the signal. You're just making copies and copies. I mean, is that is, is that is, is that a fair explanation? Yeah. So if if the if the little primers can find their target area, and the primers are very specific for the bug that we're talking about, so I can have primers in a tube that are specific for for trichomonas, but I in the same tube. I have primers specific for chlamydia and different primers specific for gonorrhea. And once that primer takes a hold of that DNA sequence, then it just makes copies and copies and copies. And you can go from one copy to a billion copies in 40 cycles of amplification. And with some of these miniaturized and you know super fast things now, that can be done in half an hour. It's incredible to me. That is that does seem incredible because with 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 
with cultures, you have you mentioned that they may take days to grow something like mm -hmm. that, right? Yeah, three yeah. to five days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I heard you talking about the primers for the different things. So it sounds like you can test for multiple STIs with a single sample. So there you go. That's much more convenient. Right. So you can test um, on most of the platforms that are commercially available. You can test for chlamydia gonorrhea trick from one sample. On many of them, you can add mycoplasma genitalium if that's appropriate, which it's only appropriate for symptomatic people. But if it's appropriate, you can add it. And on some of the platforms, now at least three of them, you can also test for the common causes of vaginitis. So BV or candida. So again, one swab, and look what you can get. You can get this comprehensive vaginal evaluation so that you know everything that's going on in that vagina. Now, obviously, if it's urine from a penis, you're not gonna test for the vaginal samples, right? Or the vaginal pathogens, but you can do the chlamydia gonorrhea trick. And like I said, if there are symptoms, then you can add mycoplasma in there. So we've really come a long way, baby. It sounds like it. Um... So listen to that discussion. I mean, I know that with HIV, we talk a lot about like rapid tests, rapid PCR point of care tests, um, and the value they have in just getting that quick that that quick feedback. Um, what about rapid PCR uh, point of care tests for trick? Uh, what's going on there? So we have one right now that is a thirty minute test. Well, we have one that's a ninety minute test, and before we decide that ninety minute tests are way too long. Um, studies that are really great implementation studies in the UK have shown that even if only 20% of people wait, we actually treat people differently because of those immediate results. So we change treatment regimens because of that. And so we can have an impact on the 20% who wait and the 80% who leave if they know their result was supposed to be ready that same day, they get treated five times faster. So the time between being in the clinic and getting treatment goes from 10 days to two days. So, so the 90 minute test is not ideal, but it's not garbage either. So we need to keep that in the back of our mind. And then the 30 minute tests still may be a little slower than we want, but in 30 minutes, if we can do chlamydia and gonorrhea, which we have one platform that can do chlamydia and gonorrhea, either from a vaginal swab or urine from a penis. And we have another one that can do chlamydia, gonorrhea and trick, but only using vaginal swabs. So nothing's perfect yet, but boy, we're moving in the right direction. And it sounds like some of the utility there may be, uh, you get fairly quick test results back, then you can go ahead and treat the patients so you don't risk losing them to follow up or. Anything. Yeah, and we use this in our student health clinic, which is a very, very, very efficient clinic. And with people that weren't even planning on a sexual health screen when they came in, if they said they wanted one, we had them self collect their sample immediately after registration. And then that sample could start running Sometimes the result can be ready before you interact with a clinician, but certainly it could be ready. The longest that we added to anybody's wait time was 11 minutes. So people could certainly wait for that result. And these were students who, again, hadn't planned on this, but despite their class schedule and other things going on in their lives, 80 some odd percent of them say they'd stay and wait for the results because 11 minutes wasn't gonna kill them. So yeah, now we can do accurate treatment, which is so important for managing our antimicrobials and making sure that we're not just throwing antibiotics at people without knowing that they actually have the infections we're trying to treat. So this, this episode was, is of course about diagnostics, but if you'll let me go off script just a little bit, I wanna ask you about the I know with STIs, there's just the impact of stigma, of shame, how that impacts clinic interactions. It's just, it's just such a drag that people have to deal with that. Is there anything regarding TRIC in terms of patient counseling messages that we really you think need to be uh, uh, getting out there? TRIC is kind of funny because TRIC is in a lot of these vaginal panels because it does, it actually is a vaginal pathogen, not a cervical pathogen. But that said, when people test vaginal panels and test for chlamydia gonorrhea trick, it's not nearly as stigmatized. And so what happens, I mean, I've had this personal experience where I went into my healthcare provider, I had a discharge, they said, oh, well, let's check you out for BV and trick in Canada. And I'm like, well, what about chlamydia and gonorrhea? And they go, oh no, you're married, you can't have those. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's where we run into problems. I think a lot of our education actually, um, 
these poor providers, you gotta recognize that in medical school out of four years of education, they get about four hours of sexual health. And so this is not something that we do a good job of teaching healthcare providers. And we need to do better at that because right now I think the healthcare providers are the ones who actually are the most affected by the stigma. They're afraid to bring it up because they're afraid their patients will think they're being judged. You know, they just, I think that there's a lot of stuff happening that when we break through that barrier, it becomes just a normal part of, when you go into the doctor's office, you provide a urine sample routinely if you're a woman. So what if they just say, well, here's your urine cup and here's your vaginal swab. You give it to every single person who walks through the door, you just pulled all the stigma right out of that. But it also opens up that opportunity that when I go back and see my provider, I'm like, hey, what was that swab for anyway? I've never seen that before. And we can have that conversation, but it doesn't come up in a way that has any judgmental quality to it at all, right? And I, so I think these point of care tests where we do sample collection first are gonna really help us get rid of a lot of the stigma. Sounds like we've got a lot to do on both the patient and provider side. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think you make such a good point about, about during the training that clinicians just aren't getting a lot of sexual health education. I mean, we can't really expect them to talk about all of these things effectively if we're not giving them models, you know, they can use to do so. So that's, uh, I And it's really that. hard, but I, I mean, if you think about a doctor's office visit and they're supposed to keep it to, I don't know what it is, 11 minutes, 17 minutes, it depends right. on insurance you've right. got, but, but it's yeah. really hard to get in the, well, how's your blood pressure and what are you eating and what are you doing for exercise mm -hmm. and how's your sex life? And, you know, but the reality is, and I, I just gave a, a talk for residents and fellows recently where I asked the people in the audience to think carefully, how many people in your practice have ever committed suicide? And I don't want to see a show of hands, but I hope the number is super small. But how many people in your practice have ever had sex? And when you think about it that way, I'm asked every time I go to the doctor's office if I've had suicidal ideation in the last X amount of time. And I've never once been asked about, you know, my sex life. That's gotta change. And I'm not saying we should get rid of the suicidal ideation. I'm saying we need to really get the sexual health bit in there and just make it a part of your normative conversation, right? But patients need to, patients need to be asked because we let our providers drive that conversation because we know they have a list of things that they're asking us because mm -hmm. they're looking out for our best interests. So we let them go through their laundry list and we're not going to just say, Hey, you didn't ask me about my sex life. Right. Yeah. So, right. so unfortunately, until we get past the point where we depend on the providers to start the conversation, you know, we need to do more to help yeah. facilitate those conversations. That's a good point. So in the show notes, uh, I'm going to put a link to one of our fact sheets, 10 things to ask your healthcare provider about. Oh, good. Health. There you go. And I will also link to our trick diagnostics page. Bobby, thank you so much. This is amazing. I really appreciate this. See, listeners, this is why you keep tuned into Asher because we think <laughs> folks like Bobby. So there you go. Thank you. I appreciate it. You're welcome. All right, and dear listeners, thank you for tuning us in. You keep checking us out. We'll have more podcast episodes and give us feedback. Info at ashsexualhealth.org. Until next time, this is Fredo. Take care, everybody.